October is upon us, and we're taking this opportunity to dip into the horror genre. The year is 1979. Director Ridley Scott teams up with some of the most innovative creators in the industry to bring us one of the greatest movie monsters of all time and a terrifying vehicle to bring it into audiences' nightmares. In space, no one can hear you scream. We're talking Alien on this episode of Script or Scream. Hello and welcome. My name is Christopher Kitchen. I am one of your co-hosts of Scripter Screen, alongside my other co-host, Zach Strachman. Mwahaha! Happy Halloween! Funny enough, this episode isn't even coming out on Halloween. It's no, just it's coming not. out <laughs> at like the later days of October. Happy are... mid-October! Mwahaha! Oh god. Zach, how are you doing? Uh, I'm doing pretty good. How are you? I'm well. Are you sure you're okay? That laugh didn't sound like you're. I feel like you I'm need in some a help. I'm in a spooky mood because it's October. How do you feel about October? About spooky season, if you will. Well, this spooky season's a little spookier because we got a a pandemic that's just that's just ruining the year. Uh, but in general, I, I like October. I like Halloween. Always have. It's always been one of my favorite uh, holidays. I like seeing the decorations. Uh, I like seeing the cheap, crappy uh, uh, costumes, and uh, yeah, I, li- I like Halloween. How about I you? Saw, well, I, I mean, listen, my birthday's in October, and I gotta say, a lot of people say it's a waste because I hate Halloween. <laughs> what? <laughs> I yeah, I'm I am not a fan of. Actually, that's not a lie. I haven't always not been a fan of Halloween. Did you I'll stop? Say, did you stop liking Halloween after you stopped getting candy for it? Pretty much, because now there's no point. Because I can't just go around <laughs> knocking door to door asking for candy. Because people could. are going to be like, who are you, you grown man? What are you doing at my door? Uh, I'm calling the cops. That's Especially I mean. if I were to come dressed as sexy hand sanitizer. What? I, don't <laughs> I don't know. Is if that a thing? I don't know if you've seen it. There was a post somewhere. I think I saw it on Instagram I'm gonna have or to, something. Hold on, hold on. I'm going to have to Google this. <laughs> Yeah, there, there's like costumes now. Where people sexy. It's it's, hand it's advertised hand. as sexy hand sanitizer. It Let's is see. quite possibly my favorite costume of the season. Okay, so it looks like it is a woman in a like a a leotard, maybe. Yeah, you see, that's my issue. Why <laughs> aren't there any sexy men costumes advertised with the pictures? Well, it looks like okay, so it looks like she's got like this um clear plastic uh like dress. Oh, well, and I well, get. I what get it. I so, saw, like, that's that's supposed to be like the 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 hand hand the Purell. I was gonna say, yeah. What I saw was like a Purell bottle, and it's just like had like an hourglass shape or something like that, or and you would just kind of put it over yourself. Either way, um, what by an the way, costume. there are also there are also <laughs> pictures uh, on Google Images of just hand sanitizer bottles. Uh, okay, that are somehow being flagged when I type "sexy hand sanitizer." Oh, um, okay. Anyway, I think we're getting off the rails a bit, so. Uh, I mean, outside of that, Halloween has been it's it's an okay holiday for those who like it. I personally am more of a fan of the fall season than the uh, the spooky Halloween part. As you know, I am quite the pumpkin enthusiast, the pumpkin spice enthusiast. To your yes. dismay, I'm no, quite annoying I, about it. <laughs> I, I I don't mind pumpkin spice, but I think the people who claim it's their favorite thing ever should say it all year round, not just in the holidays. But I mean, okay. I I, hey. I told. I've told you my perspective. I would say it all year round if they served it all year round, which <laughs> unfortunately they, you can go to they don't. And you can buy, you can buy a uh, uh, a thing I'll, of pumpkin spice. I'll tell you what, Keurig with their little K cups, they don't sell like the Starbucks pumpkin spice latte things all year round, and it's only they start in September and they end uh, sometime in December or like late fall, late November. It's infuriating. It's infuriating. You know um, what? I'm going to find you a big thing of pumpkin spice so you can just keep at your home I, and then you I, have it all I, year I round. I did. I did. And you know what? I think it expired in like March oh, no. or something. No, it's I all, mean, I, I think I let maybe. It's all apart. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, hey, you know what's great about uh, October uh, and Halloween time that neither of us really take advantage of? What's that, Zach? Horror movies. Uh, oh, you're right. Because both I, of us are giant babies and we don't like horror movies yeah i i gotta say growing up uh was not quite the fan of horror movies in fact i feared for my life during most horror movies let me ask Uh, you this what was what was as a kid what was your biggest like 
hell no, I'm not going anywhere near that. Um, so on the, the day of my aunt's wedding, um, I forget how old I was. I was maybe a, around 10, if not a little after 10 years old. Mm-hmm. Um, my now cousin uh, was watching a movie about a little killer doll. Oh, uh, nice. By the name of uh, Charles. Um, Charles Lee Ray. Charles Lee Ray other, or Chucky, if you will. Um, <laughs> and that's when I closed the door and I was like, nope. And ever since then, I haven't been able to actually walk into a Spencer's Gifts for years <laughs> because they hang them, like the dolls, on like the top, like around all the fixtures. Yeah, yeah. It, it's quite literally the only reason why, to this day, I haven't walked in a Spencer's Gifts. Um, well, so it's actually funny because yeah. uh, same. it was the same thing for me. Chucky was like my big no-go area. Yeah. But, so like, I vividly remember as a very, very young child going over to my grandparents' house uh, with my family and watching the first, like, one or two movies with my sister um, and 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 seeing, like, the, the, the horrible stuff that Chucky did. And really, it didn't bother me. And it wasn't, oh, until, it wasn't until I was a little bit older that, I don't know, something just kind of snapped and I was like, oh, that's terrifying. Well, um, And it's well, only well, now that I'm getting a little older where I'm like, oh, these are actually kind of funny movies. I, I will say, I think I've gone back and seen clips on YouTube just to try to, like, you know, ease the pain, if you, you gotta will. You got to face your fears. Exactly. I, I faced some of my fears. You know, my fear of heights, I faced it a couple years ago. I went skydiving. Nice. I still can't, up, can't stand up straight on a ladder without, oh. like, wanting to shake, but I can jump out of a plane 10,000 feet from the sky or hey, from the I ground. Can't, I can't do that, so props. Um, I, I will say, though, I, I feel like part of the reason why I'm not a big fan of, like, horror or, or, you know, I have a big fear of these imaginary things is I have a crazy, wild imagination, and it kind of, trans, you know, it transfers into my dreamscape. As an adult, I, I'm very prone to having nightmares and, like, waking up in the middle of the night. Like, even, I feel like I had a nightmare twice in the last week. Oy. Or, I guess, nightmares. Yeah, I know. Well, it's, uh, it sucks. Yeah, I mean, f- for for me, uh, I don't go out of my way to see a horror movie. And I think that's twofold. One, because I think a lot of horror movies are really poorly made. Okay. And, and they're not really horror movies as they are startling movies. Okay. Um, where I think, you know, they, they cash in on cheap little, you know, jump scares and, and stuff rather than actually building horror and tension and terror and all those good things. Uh, but it's usually whenever I am told, Hey, this movie is this horror movie that came out. It's just a good film. Yeah. You should go see it. Cause it's got some really good like talent behind it and it's very innovative. Uh, then I go like, okay, well I, I'll have to. I'll have to be brave and go see it. And I think of movies like uh, The Babadook came out uh, not too long ago. The right. Witch. Uh, uh, yeah, I, I, I feel like Hereditary. More... Hereditary was a bad mistake uh, because <laughs> I, saw, I, I decided like a crazy person to watch that movie by myself no. in a big empty room. No. And <laughs> boy, did I regret it because that movie yeah. was that movie's amazing, but it's so scary. Yeah, I feel like more recently with these, with these, there's there's a certain level of quality that is kind of arising out of very specific kind of horror thriller genres. I feel like it's because of the thriller genre that's mm-hmm. kind of bringing me back into horror esque. And like you're right, like the talents around him. Like I feel I, I'm trying to think. So I mentioned um, uh, a movie on the last on our Cora episode mm-hmm. um, that featured Kiernan Shir- Shirpka, right? That's her name. Yes, um, yeah. that I watched. It was kind of thriller-esque more so than horror, but, I mean, it had horror elements in it called The Black Coat's Daughter. Okay. watched that a couple years ago um, with my girlfriend, and, and yeah, that movie was just, like, kind of sinister in a way. I don't know. I don't like movies about, like, you, 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 like and, religion, and just, just religious be, themes. Just to be sure, you're not talking sinister, the movie. You're just saying the, no. the overall... Like, uh, like, sinister themes, or, like like, movies that take religious contexts and make that or like certain parts of them and make it like certain iconography and things like that. They just make me uncomfortable. Yeah. Right. As as I grew grew up with, with, you know, like a a religious kind of upbringing in a way. Um, And so (laughs) there's always that little bit of fear that I guess is still kind of left inside of me that just kind of left a mark. And so when I see someone use like symbols of the devil or things like that, I'm just like, Oh my God, like I hate this or like certain imagery. 
I kind of I, I love that stuff to be honest. Um, and actually, I I was seeing some reviews hit the internet not too long ago, like this past week of um this movie that's coming out called Saint Maud. Okay. And it's getting really good reviews, and it I I am very interested because it is kind of like this uh, you know, supposed to be about like you know, religious stuff and uh. It, oh, this it, this is like the girl that like steps into like the shoes with the nails and everything like that. I think it's in the trailer. It's the, yeah, I, 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 I'm the, looking uh, at like I'm looking at images of the trailer right now. It's the, it's this movie from a twenty four. It does look very well done, uh, and I may just watch it. But oh my god, I'm gonna hate every little <laughs> second of it. Yeah, um, but I mean that's like but, my feeling but, with Hereditary. Like I enjoyed a lot of the movie, but like oh my god, did that movie make me really uncomfortable at it every? Yeah. That movie, that movie had me checking corners uh, anytime yeah, I entered yeah. a room. Yeah, but uh, yeah, I think I I, I like that we're kind of getting back to a time of really artistically powerful horror movies. Movies yeah. that like you know, listen. I think the worst thing that happened to horror movies was just uh, jump scares and and. Studios I mean, like I don't want to I don't want to call out like all of Blumhouse, but like a lot of their movies because some of their movies are good, but a lot of their movies are just these very cheaply made jump scare fests that make a ton of money, and so they can just turn them out really easily. And okay. I think personally, I would prefer uh, more from the the Ari Asters of the world. I, yeah, I will say the commercialization of kind of like the horror films and just making franchises upon things, um, though it's given, you know, work to some good, you know, actors and actresses and like some interesting performances like like Patrick Wilson in the Conjuring series and everything like I like Patrick Wilson a lot as an actor. I'm mm-hmm. not a big fan of the Conjuring. I actually don't, I haven't seen any of them, but it's I like saw, I'm, I'm I saw glad he's getting one. work. You know, yeah, like, no, I'm, it's that's wonderful. I I saw the first Conjuring and I'll tell you this. It wasn't scary for me. Mm-hmm. I, it, if anything, it was a little. It was far more interesting than it was scary. Um, and when the scares started happening, I don't know why, but I just thought it, they were funny. Um, I think yeah, for me, it, like like one of the biggest movies that it's. I don't know if necessarily they're scary, but like um, they were just kind of really messy. If that um, was mm-hmm. like the Saw franchise, right? Those were just gory. I don't think they're right. scary. Right. They. I mean, they had like those horror elements and stuff to it, but those were the ones I could kind of bear, and I would I would start to watch as I got older. Um, but more recently, I guess with the the currently uh, in kind of production hell, or I guess delayed hell, uh, Spiral with Chris Rock starring. Oh yeah, yeah, that's that, coming back. And Samuel one, Jackson. And Samuel L. Jackson. That one actually really piqued my interest. One, because the talent behind it. Because, I mean, I don't know about you, but I've really been enjoying season four of Fargo featuring Chris Rock. And I'm also a fan of Chris Rock's work in the past. Yeah, he's, he's great. Uh, like, and- I, I really like seeing him in these in these roles, or at least, like, in his this kind of new path of his career, rather. Like, I think that was, a, that was a really cool thing for that, when that, when that uh, first trailer came out, because... Mm-hmm. Everyone was like, "Oh, this! Where did this come from?" It's a new entry in the Saw series, yeah. Uh, which I, I think right after the first one just immediately went downhill. Sure. Um, yeah, but, and they, um, they they took a lot of weird turns in their story, and just you know, it's all about like how could we make uh, the next trap more gruesome or, yeah, in a and, way, and like, more convoluted. And yeah, I think so. Yeah, I think you know, I. I won't go out of my way to see a horror movie unless there, it has to have something about it. And I think, uh, one of the things I'm, uh, recently reminded that we all together went to go see the two of us, a bunch of our friends. I think we got somewhere around like 12 people all to go in a group to go see it was, uh, 2017's it. Did, oh, we did see it together. Did we? And, that, uh, that was see- a, at least the first one, because I don't think the second one's all that scary. Again, mm-hmm. it is more of a concept that I find far more interesting than scary. But that first one's pretty freaky. Yeah, I don't know if uh, I was in the right state of mind when I <laughs> when we watched that. That that movie itself, um, 
just interest i just remember myself sitting like arms across my chest like my hat super <laughs> low like yep i'm in a theater i'm watching this and uh, when did that come out like two years ago something that, like that that was 2017 i believe three oh my god like yeah that was a fun experience i'm not listen man i'm a, i'm a man i'm not a i'm not a baby i'm a man <laughs> you know like but i mean just something I hate movies that make me want to get out of my seat. I want to move. Listen, I'd rather watch a movie where I'd cry five or ten times than a movie that'll just make me dream about something terrible later. Um, I, I <laughs> well, don't know about you. That's how I feel. No, I I, I totally agree. Um, I, I like I said, I won't go out of my way to see horror movies. I can appreciate the art behind them. And if I'm gonna enjoy a horror movie, the the ones I think I enjoy the most beyond the the artistically like you know strong ones and the ones made by very good directors are the I think the Friday the 13th series has been one of my favorites growing up because they're not scary again uh in the second Friday the 13th Jason Voorhees gets kicked in the balls and falls down so I mean like you know it's not scary but I can appreciate the the legacy of them yeah uh which hey that's a great segue because talk about legacy the movie we're going to talk about has a huge legacy and is one of the biggest, you know, most well-known horror movie monsters of all time. That is correct, Zach. Today we're talking Alien. Alien. Ridley Scott's Alien from yeah. 1979. Uh, now, what a movie. I, I'll say. This is, so, this is probably a very iconic, uh, incredibly um, uh, influential film on a lot of people. And we kind of happened upon this film, you know, like most people our age, that it just kind of existed as we grew up. Yeah, so you say? We, yeah, we, along with many movies, pretty much any movie that came out before we were born, right. but really, like, there are some tentpole movies across the span of time that they are such cultural milestones that they become ingrained into the into society and the vernacular with how we speak and they are referenced so commonly because you know they, they are so it's it's so ubiquitous with with the world it's so famous everywhere that like things i'm talking like like star the alien, wars French, star wars uh, especially empire strikes back i have never lived in a world where i didn't know Luke was Darth Vader's father. I'm sorry if that's a spoiler for Wait, anyone out there. Who did you are just you? Say, did you just say Luke was Darth Vader's father? <laughs> Excuse me. Darth Vader is <laughs> Luke's father. That's the second twist. No. But, uh, yeah, I don't think that's... A, I, as a, I was making a joke that I don't think that's a spoiler anymore because it's so, it's so commonly understood. I'm pretty sure people were making jokes about I am your father... Before I even knew it's, what it's Star Wars no, was. No, I'm your father. Not well, yeah. I am your father. I, God, I, Zach. Yeah, get, it, get out. But, you know uh, you know what I'm I'm really jealous of are those YouTube videos you see where it's like parents like, oh, my kid reacts to um, the Empire Strikes Back famous <laughs> scene. And it's like, I I can't remember if I ever had that moment. I don't think I did. I, I, I don't, don't remember think I did. Just, I... just playing and putting in the VHS of, of New Hope, Empire Strikes Back, and Return of the Jedi, and just like I just knew everything about that, and I just you know, I, and yeah, I would just do it on repeat. I think it's one of those things. It was, I mean, we're talking about things that were referenced in like our cartoons growing up, and yeah. in the video games we played, and things. It, it's these, they're these things, you know, that are so deeply woven into the fabric of our culture that you know. Like things like F think the about it, chest burster in Alien. Right. right, that is something that if you go into the movie completely blind, you've never heard anything about Alien. Uh, I have to imagine that is probably a part in my French a fucking crazy scene. <laughs> so I, I mean, I'll tell you what. It wasn't actually until our research that I realized that the thing had a name as chest burster. Yeah, yeah. Uh, same, well, I guess Facehugger I've heard before, and Xenomorph I've heard before, but Chestburster was was a very um, specific thing for me. I, I, so I, I mentioned this to you earlier, but my first experience 
with the chestburster it didn't even come from Alien. It came from the, <laughs> my first time viewing Spaceballs, the the lovely comedy featuring Rick Moranis, um, our president from the what is the movie? Uh, He's Independence in with Will Smith. Day. Independence Day. Yeah, um, just this John like John Candy, Joan Rivers, Mel Brooks. Yeah, it's you know classic, right? And so when it's when Barf and um, Lone, Lone Star. Star go to the space diner. And then, like, I guess someone ordered the special, yep. and then it's John Hurt, and he's like, oh, no, not again. I had to look back on the IMDb page just to make sure that actually was John Hurt. It's John Hurt. It's John Hurt, <laughs> yeah. And, and of course, then the uh, alien, the, the baby xenomorph, puts on a, to- a little top hat. He, he sings the Merry Melodies, Looney Tunes. Hello, my baby. Hello, my honey. <laughs> Which was fantastic. Like, it's for- it's. As far as um, all of Mel Brooks' gags, it's maybe one of my favorites. Yeah, definitely. Uh, and I don't think it would have been and probably unless... one of his more appropriate gags too. And yeah, and I it's it's up there because it is John Hurt, you know. Yeah. And and you know I, he, he could have just gotten... he, he's credited in Spaceballs as John Hurt, like John Hurt <laughs> playing at John Hurt. So I I also love that as well. Yeah, um, it's great. But, but um, that, but yeah, that was so, my first experience with a, with the chestburster, for example. Like, and then later on, like with the xenomorph, I didn't even realize that it had its own movie until Alien vs. Predator came out. <laughs> I'm like, oh, that is from Alien vs. Predator. Like, as a stupid child that didn't know anything. Um, <laughs> well, I I know that uh, I grew up. Um, I, I credit a lot of my uh, uh, passion for movies uh, with. Uh, my parents, you know, they, they got me into a lot of the stuff. And, you know, my dad was a huge fan of the Alien movie back when it first came out. And I think uh, my parents, their first uh, date when they started going out was to go see Aliens, the uh, the sequel. Um, and so, like, you know, it's that's, one of That's the... fun. My parents met in a hot tub. Oh, sweet. <laughs> and then and then my step-parents, or I guess my step-parents, my mom and my stepdad met at the club. So... Well, Wow. That's a lot more fun. Hey, you never know where it's going to find you. I, I, I do want to mention, though, but I guess my affinity for movies is when my, my stepdad and I, we would kind of go to Best Buy like every uh, Friday or something like that. And we would pick out, as it was just him and I was the, the whole family, as it were. Um, and we would just kind of pick out DVDs and, and then Blu-rays and just kind of like get like a, a compile a collection for like the week of what we would watch. And nice. then also the amount of times we would just kind of go to movies. Never did we ever see something like, um, uh, what what is it? Uh, Alien. But yeah. we would go see like Changeling or like just kind of like these these dramas. That's you know, a very, these, that's a very things. mature film for <laughs> right for a young person. Um, I know, but I, but I mean, like that's so that's interesting. Your parents met when watching Alien. That's well, they didn't like, meet watching I mean, Alien. Right? They, that was that the, was the, their uh, that yeah. was how he courted her. <laughs> <laughs> but um, but what's great is um, he uh. I, I rem, you know, I grew up with that stuff, so I remember, I well, the first time I watched it, I watched it with my dad, and I was, I don't remember how old I was, maybe like twelve or thirteen, but it terrified the heck out of me, uh, and but even going into that movie, I knew that you know, I I knew even though I didn't know what scene was going to happen, I knew at some point a uh, alien would burst out of someone's chest because I just knew that these were the the steps that went into an alien brand movie. Mm -hmm. Um, But I have to, you know, I'm so envious of those people in 1979 who got to sit in the theater. I'm envious of people like my dad where they got to be in that movie and look up at that screen and watch as uh, this character who up until this point, we don't really know what's happening with him suddenly starts convulsing on a table and, you know, again, for today's uh, for today's society, you watch you watch that kind of movie, an alien movie, and you go, well, this person's acting sick. At some point, an alien is gonna pop out of one point in their body. Mm-hmm. Uh, but for 1979 to look up at that and be like, what the yeah, hell is happening? Def- definitely a little gruesome. I don't know if I've seen anything like that kind of happen in that regard. For any of the movies that happened in the last, it's funny because like Alien Covenant came out not too long ago, and I remember there's a scene in Alien Covenant where 
the alien rips out of a dude's body. But yeah. even when I was watching that, I'm like, okay, it's not a matter of if, it's a matter of where. <laughs> I, I, you know, I when rewatching rewatching Alien Covenant, I watched it once. Um, I, I realized that one's probably the most similar to Alien, the first one. Yeah, I would I, I say that maybe. any other one. Uh, well, yeah, uh, well, yeah. I, I, I'll I mean, of, of of the newer films, I guess. Of, well, I guess there's only two, right? Prometheus and this one. Um, Unless you count Alien Covenant movies. I, I'll tell you what, I haven't even seen those. I, I've seen them, but I haven't seen them. You know what I like I like the second one for all the wrong reasons. But sure. um <laughs> No, but it's cool. I you know I'm I'm envious of the people who got to see that with fresh eyes, knowing nothing of the series, having no preconceived notions. Before and, the term franchise ever existed. And and you know, being in the theater being like, What the hell am I? watching take place you know i'm i'm jealous of the people in 1980 who got to find out about darth vader before anyone knew that that was a thing you know it's you know it's it's a consequence of living in the time we do i i you know this show i guess we don't play on nostalgia but it's like we we come with fresh perspective or i guess sort of fresh perspective as much as a film podcast can have right uh, for, that's for made a, in 2020 for a 40 year old movie exactly um but i i just feel like you know um it's well, how do we feel about it now zach what do, what do we look at it when we think I, now how it compares to these days because isn't that what we do we compare movies from from 40 years ago to how they stack up or was it well, I, would say, 79? I would say it's pretty good yeah, it's 40 years ago. i would I, say it's a it stacks up pretty well I, I mean, for the saturated kind of market that is uh, horror films, I'd say this one is pretty good. I would yeah. agree. <laughs> Except, all right, so let's let's get into it, right? Let's get into the movie. Let's start well, off with well, my favorite thing. Okay, go ahead. A brief synopsis. Ooh, sure. You, uh, you hit them with the synopsis, and then maybe we can we can discuss some of the uh, the background production. I, I, okay. This Possibly. comes to us from, as uh, the first synopsis given to us on IMDb's page for Alien, the 1979 film. Rated R, hour and 57 minutes. <laughs> um, I won't go through all that. Okay. After a space merchant vessel receives an unknown transmission as a distress call, one of the crew is attacked by a mysterious life form as they soon realize that its life cycle has merely begun. Ooh, ominous. And, and the tagline, Zach? In in space, no one can hear you in space. No. Well, close oh. enough. That's what your t-shirt says. <laughs> That's what Alan is. Uh, yeah, in space, no one can hear you scream. That's a wonderful tagline. I think that's great. I think, you know, way, what a way to sell. It's horror, and it's in space. <laughs> I agree. Um, so, let's get it. Well, you were saying something earlier before I... I... Oh, no, I uh, just uh, you know I want to look at the uh, the the people who brought us this this terrifying movie because um, Ridley Scott this is only his second film uh, before that he had done The Duelist um, so you know pretty fresh to it I only I I'm kind of kicking myself because it was only until right before sitting down to record this I found out I realized Ridley Scott's 82 years old he is an old dude uh, I'm sure he likes to hear that. <laughs> <laughs> Ridley, I'm sorry, but it's the truth. Uh, yeah, he's an older dude. I thought he was maybe a bit younger. So by the time he got to this, I mean, he wasn't old, but he's, you know, when you hear about these, like, early directorial Yeah, debuts, like, 79 was known for, you know, you George Lucas and Spielberg and... Yeah, and, and all these guys are fre- and fresh-faced you, little boys coming yeah. into the Hollywood thing. And I, I'd say Ridley's, the seasoned director of the time was, like... Kubrick was still around, you know, like... Yeah. It was... Uh, so, yeah, I think, you know, this is his only his second film. His next film after this is Blade Runner, so he goes, like, he knocks two I was going to say, park. he goes for zero to 100 real quick. Well, I mean, Blade Runner, though, wasn't a uh, commercial success at first, wasn't it? it... No, I, I, and I think, you know, that, that's something we'll even see with this, where I think Alien was a very big success, but I don't think it was appreciated as much today as it was in its time, or maybe mm-hmm. it wasn't. It wasn't a critical darling back then, uh, but it made a bunch of money. Budget of eight, anywhere between eight point four to fourteen million dollars. 
box office of a two hundred and three point six million. Now, now, what is that adjusted for inflation? I don't know. I didn't. I didn't do the math. I'm oh. gonna say a lot, um, <laughs> more than I have in my wallet. But uh, That's, you know, can't deny <laughs> but, that. You know, this is uh, it, just the team behind this is insane. You know, you have okay, so Dan O'Brien, uh, Dan O'Bannon as the writer, uh, who would go on a few years later to do the return of the living dead movie, which is what popularized the idea of the zombie saying brains, you know, which is, I feel like a, a fun horror movie trope that, uh, we can thank him for. So he's, he's writing this movie. Thanks Dan O'Bannon. Thank you. Uh, music by Jerry Goldsmith, uh, did a lot of sci-fi, uh, musical work. Um, and then you have like the people uh, who worked with O'Bannon. I'm talking Chris Foss, uh, Jean Girard, and of course H.R. Giger, who, if anyone's footprint, kind of left is... its one of the <laughs> biggest marks. It's it's Giger's. Yeah, I think this dude's the the scope of influence that this man has left on the entertainment industry is so massive the i mean the alien it is it is such a an iconic looking creature the architecture of like inside the ship the alien ship is it's well that, that's i mean i used the word already but it's iconic it you can't mistake it for anything else i've seen uh there's a uh you know we're talking in 2020 uh I, I know we both like video games. They announced a video game that's coming out for uh, the new Xbox called Scorn, and mm-hmm. if you, and it is just dripping with uh, HR Geeker inspired art. If you like, you know, just search like the game Scorn, it looks like something out of Alien. Even things um, I, I've heard a lot of people cite uh, the anime Yu Yu Hakusho that uh, when it gets into one of its later arcs, which is a massive tournament, the arena is very Geiger inspired. Oh, yeah. Inspired. Now, that I think, now that I think about it, I, I see it. A lot of curves, a lot of ribs, a lot of carapaces. Yeah, yeah I mean, well, I think, you know, it's it's definitely also how, or I guess the design kind of caters to, like, the tone of the film and everything. Or I guess it, yeah. it just kind of all works super well. And then, you know, the, just the production design as a whole... You know, just these these miniatures, some of these these sets, they're yeah. all like super like they have this this great dark industrial um, kind of like old commercial, very used, not not very pretty looking, lived not, in, yeah, very lived in spaces um, that you know in a way like have a texture. They're a character in their own right, you know, or at least like they they're they kind of and they're not appreciate. I mean, I guess yeah, they're appreciated, right? <laughs> um, but it's like you know when you watch the movie outside of just Actually, no, the movie does do a really good job of, like, having, at least in the beginning, these kind of long takes of, like, mm-hmm. and, like, these pans and tilts of, like, the set and everything before you get into the characters waking yeah, up. Yeah, I, lo- like I love that. the opening of this movie. It's it's yeah. quiet. It's I, understated. I, well, I mean, it's it takes a, a, a page out of uh, 2001, right? Where, you know, you have the yeah, slow crawl I, I of, that. of of the, the ships, like, into space. I mean, even in Star Wars. And Star Wars gets it from them as well. And, um... It's just that 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 kind of feel. I love I love the look of space in movies, man. Yeah. Every, everybody just kind of gets it right to like at least the point of which I I hope it's right. I mean, I'm no astronaut and yeah, we have cameras in space and satellites and all this crap, but like, you know, that is just some really I like how everybody kind of respects that that's what <laughs> space looks like when you're there because I haven't seen yeah. anybody try to do it too different. Uh yeah, it's great. I I love the the sets both uh in the in the alien uh, on on the planet in the sh- in al- bleh, in the alien ship uh, on the planet in the Nostromo, um, I think it's what a great. name Nostromo. Yeah, the, I mean, yeah, that's it's a it's a great name for it. Uh, and, and I like that uh, Giger he designed the alien. It's kind of twofold. So the alien was partly designed off his other other art that he has done, um, mm-hmm. and his. He has a, he used to talk about how he creates art of things that make him that frighten him, and 
there's this uncomfortableness to all to a lot of his stuff. A lot of there's a lot of phallic imagery in his uh, in his um, art, and a lot of just a lot of. I mean, I say uncomfortable. Uh, it depends on the person, I suppose. But um, you know, I I think even like the design of the alien, it's just it's just so unnerving, and even though it is designed to literally be alien, like to be other from from what we as humans are uh, understand and and know to be uh, comforting design, it it blends so well with the industrial uh, setting of the Nostromo. Yeah. All the tubes and all the the pipes and stuff do such a good job of hiding the the alien that a lot of times you don't know it's right there. Yeah, I was gonna say like it it kind of allows its you know it, it has this um this kind of me- and not it gives it this extra mechanism but like uh, what what's the 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 biological or I guess the animal study term for it like it's their defense mechanism in a way that they can. Yeah just kind of like disguise themselves with their surroundings. And it just so happens his surroundings are all like these cylindrical silver metal looking things. And, you know, you like, he could store himself in a wall and it's like, Oh yeah, no one's going to find me here. Kind of like a chameleon in, in that way. Right. It, it's kind of comedic, but it's also like super intelligent. I wouldn't have thought that something <laughs> like that would have played a role later on in the film. Like he's going to, it's like almost like a game of hide and seek. Uh, yeah. <laughs> It's it's kind of excellent in that regard. I I I think it's great. Uh, I think there's a lot of instances in the movie, and it's one of my favorite things in any movie, uh, especially in the horror genre, when there's something on screen and you don't realize it's there until it's too late. Yeah. Um, which uh, Alien does pretty well. Um, the a lot of these guys, H. R. Giger, Chris Foss, uh, Jim Gerard, they were all before they moved to and, and uh and Dan O'Bannon, they were all working on uh, Hodorowski's Dune before uh, before they moved to Alien, and they were all, if you look at some of the art that was going to go into uh, Hodorowski's Dune, a lot of it is very, obviously very Giger-inspired, and, well, I shouldn't say inspired, he did the art, but a lot of it is very reminiscent of what would go on to be an Alien, and if uh you know, Hodorowski's Dune didn't get made, we would not, or if it did get made, excuse me, if it did get made, we would not have Alien the way we have it today. So, thanks for not making Dune yet. And yeah, thanks letting, for letting... not making a 14-hour <laughs> weird movie that probably wouldn't have lived up to, you know, what the book is about Hodorowski. So, that's that's good news. But let's 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 jump into it. Let's jump forward into into the beginning of this film because you know what, I have I have a, a couple of things that I just love about it, and then there's a couple of things that I I I'm kind of questioning in terms of like the quality and how it stands, mm-hmm. um, which you shouldn't judge, but I'm going to anyway because this is my freaking show, um, ours, excuse me. <laughs> so the beginning of the film, beautiful shots. We get we get all this beautiful design of the ship and everything. We 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 get these kind of slow kind of movements through as as the kind of opening credits roll, um, or I guess as like the kind of text builds up. And and it, what an interesting font to kind of I like. Lo- as, I like, love the the title sequence. Yeah. I, I I have a feeling that people don't realize the kind of the amount of effort that goes in kind of designing some of these fonts. It's not like us where we are kind of we are, we live in an age where you. You can kind of pick and choose fonts. Most people, I guess, designers go their way to try to create their own. And back then, they didn't have Illustrator or all these other programs. They they would kind of hand cut them and and do some really great things and then put them onto celluloid. So this text, the alien font, I, I, I feel like there's a name for it that they made, but I'm not I don't I'm not sure what it is. Um, super great how it kind of builds in. Even that like that last end. Are you looking it up right now? You sound Maybe. like you are. Maybe. <laughs> <laughs> um, Oh, it turns out typing alien font into Google does literally nothing. Oh, wow. Um, it's just a really kind of subtle but interesting build if you're into like the technical side of um, you know, filmmaking in, in that regard. Uh, it would actually be nice to know who the font artist is. We'll give him some, some shout-outs. But we kind of we're, we're led finally to our subjects of the film who are in hypersleep, if you will, 
um, through yeah, their journey like into space. Suspended animation or something. We'll call it that. Um, I'm going to go with hypersleep though, just because I, you know, it's as a, a cool space, space enthusiast, <laughs> exactly. Um, we're welcomed with our first familiar face of John Hurt playing the role of Kane uh, and waking up from his slumber. But then out of nowhere, we're given this this weird kind of montage of just different angles of him just dissolving into another. And to <laughs> me, as a as an editing enthusiast and as a transition as a transitional critique, I am just jarred and I'm like, why is this the choice so, that they made? So let me let me Please, try and, th- let I, me try I, and defend I know this. I'm nitpicking. I know I am. <laughs> I think well one uh, I said this to you, not on the show, but I've said this. Uh, These dissolves that, are just driving me nuts. That you know, I don't like to judge a movie from forty years ago based on twenty twenty standards. Sure, but I think maybe it was meant to replicate this. Maybe how he was feeling coming out of a very deep sleep, because I know that supposedly when they wake up, they're halfway home. These yeah. Are, by the way, well, they're uh, ten I think, months you know, away. I guess in space uh, time. Full, full spoilers for the movie, by the way, uh, if you haven't seen it, and uh, it's been you know, four the, years. Yeah, I know, right? These are, and this is coming after I've talked at length about how this movie is so deeply ingrained in society that everyone knows about it already. But um, <laughs> I, you know, they're space truckers, uh, which I think is also a really cool thing, and they're on their way home and. At some point in the movie, when they talk about how long they have to sleep for to get the rest of the way home, they say about ten months. So let's say he's been asleep for ten months. Uh, you know, I think I'd be groggy too if I uh, woke up after a ten month sleep. So that's kind of what I saw as going on with that. Uh, with with uh, that particular edit. Right. I I mean. For me, though, as a, I love just simple hard cuts to other things, or I mean, I guess, yeah, I would call it a hard cut um, where it's just kind of you go from one scene like to the next. And like as long as the it makes sense within the space or I guess like within the 180 degree rule or something like you're not kind of breaking continuity of your film or something like that. I guess if you want to be artistic in that way and kind of design, you know, like show just the, the stages of someone kind of waking up and getting back up and everything. That's cool, but for a film that has no problem kind of getting to the picture in certain parts with a with a nice hard cut from one scene to another, like I don't see why it really <laughs> mattered because it's very artistic in other reasons, and I don't I don't feel like the art the value of the art in that sense. Um, I I don't think it had much hold on to it. If you really like, if I mean, if I'm going to be honest, it's it's the biggest nitpick I have in this movie. I think. Um, and it's really not worth much as, as is. It's it's it's, <laughs> no, it's, it's, a, it's the, a... the edit, it takes maybe thirty seconds in in the movie itself, like for this whole scene to kind of just like kind of develop I, and go through. I think I think it's a valid it's a valid point to make. Uh, uh, listen, I'll, I'll I'll tell you we're what. Talking, me- we're talking about a. Go ahead. No, no, you please, please. I was going to say we're talking about a movie where its own director said it's a said that nothing happens for the first forty five minutes. Sure. So. Well, I think you let, know maybe, maybe there's you have some valid validity to what you're saying. So let me like follow up with this then, because immediately after the sequence, when we're kind of given uh, a situation where now all of our characters are awake and are in a common area, I'm absolutely in love with everything that's going on on screen because the atmosphere is them. They're just eating, they're talking and hanging out, they're smoking cigarettes inside of their spacecraft. Because I don't know. I mean, and it's it's 1979. It's, so. it's a giant but, <laughs> space truck. It's a I, giant I, space truck, and they're yeah. I I, 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 I I'm kind of. I mean, I'm I'm a I'm a fan, or I guess kind of a proponent of like kind of casino atmosphere. Like I don't mind people smoking <laughs> in the restaurant or something like that. You know, like it's. I, I think I rewatched the movie Waiting. Have you ever seen Waiting? Unfortunately, uh, I as someone who's worked in the food industry, I love that movie. The movie's fantastic. Uh, um, okay. <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, like, just certain aspects. I realize that it's just a whatever movie, but, you know, like... Tune in just, next week for the Waiting podcast. We, uh, I'll do one. I will. No, Not the sequel, God, but no. the original. Anyways. There was a sequel? 
There. W- let's not talk about that. Talk about horror movies. <laughs> but um. Ju- and th- then I- and then Billy, if you could put like in like a boing sound effect, uh, Thank- that'd be wonderful. Thanks again to our lovely editor Billy. We appreciate you. <laughs> Ain't no trouble. You know I got two homeboys. But. The atmosphere that they're putting on, like, oh, it's, just, it's very reminiscent of a time that doesn't exist to this day. <laughs> These people are out there smoking. They're wafting flamethrowers inside their aircraft. And then you know, fast forward, you know, 35 years later, Ridley Scott makes a movie where Matt Damon's in Mars in his little space dome, a little more grounded, where he talks about, yeah, you can't have fire or explosions in, in, in my little <laughs> atmosphere, my little dome. Well, so, okay, so, like... Well, it's funny, The Martian, uh, which you're referring to, is right. a movie that went through extensive rewrites uh, to make sure, uh, when it was a novel, I mean, to make sure that the science checked out. But, like, with Alien, I liked it. I really like what, you know, the stuff you're talking about, the the atmosphere that gets kind of shown in these early scenes where you just see them talking, and you don't really catch all the lines that are being said and that's okay because it's not really the point you know i i gave shit to christopher nolan uh on our uh review of tenet in that he said that a lot of um in some movies it's only sometimes if you just get the the gist of what the characters are talking about that's good enough and for a movie like tenet i pretty much disagree nope. but for for an yeah, early I, for the setup of this movie where you're just kind of supposed to get to know okay yeah these are the they're space truckers they're blue collar workers and they've just woken up and they, they they're you know they're not the best of friends but they're definitely but, buddy buddy i it's good you know we don't need to have uh, very I mean, clear i i feel like it's super easy to say i mean there's there's a, a more minimal way of saying it right like space has kind of been done people know about space you know, inversion is, I want to say, a very, um, there's not a lot of topics in films. It's a novel concept, yeah. Yeah, so, I mean, Christopher Nolan, go f*** <laughs> yourself. Because... <laughs> well, anyway, I what I like about the opening is you can tell there's a level of casualness yeah. that, that these actors uh, all present where... You know, they all feel like they 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 know each other, that they're comfortable around each other. Uh, you know, they they walk around with like coffee mugs at their you know control stations. They're and they're, stuff they're talking and, about their shares and, and yeah, yeah, what, yeah, yeah, what's going on and yeah, they, they feel like, like just, real people. Yeah, I would say it's like it's very familiar as I you know as someone who's done kind of like labor work or like you know certain things. Like I don't know, I just feel. I feel like I'm amongst the, my people, you know. Yeah, like these, well, these they're, are... they're they're the working class, which I yeah. think you know is is a very cool thing. I think a lot of times uh, in these sci-fi's, you're getting these royalties and these important people, and and it's nice to get a, a sci-fi movie where people are just like you and me. These are miners, um, well, as in not miners, but like miner, as in they have mined ore. The Nostromo is right. a commercial or. It's mining a mining vessel, yeah. Vessel, yeah, exactly. Which is also a super cool concept. Space mining, I love that concept. You gotta get them space rocks. That, that's a that, brand new economy, that sp- mo- like, income stream we haven't really invested a lot into yet. We should. That moon cheese. As a world. Yes, um, bingo. <laughs> but then it's cool, you know, they, they, they you know, you kind of get an idea of the of who these people are very, very briefly before they're called down. They, they you know, they've been woken up early because they are tied they they work for what is just called the company which right. is kind of more so even than the alien is the bad guy of this movie and of the the series mm-hmm. uh which in this movie they're just the company in later movies they are identified as Wayland Utani mm-hmm. and they've been told like i guess there's a um a directive for the ship uh that and the crew that if they encounter certain um, distress signals or or beacons that they have to go and investigate, and so they get one for coming from this planet, and it's a it is a uh, not a distress call but a warning, and uh, that is kind of our jumping off point for some really interesting stuff, which is when they go down to the planet. Again, in this movie, not not really identified by anything, but in later movies would be, be 
it would come to be known as uh, LV-426. So, and this is kind of, we get our great, like, exploration. So, oh, well, I mean, it's it's great in some aspects, but in others, it's like, it's kind of gritty, right? In terms of, like, exploring, like, a planet and things like that. Like, this is not a beautiful No, this place. is an ugly-ass planet. This is, this is very desolate. It's all very dark. Uh, it's it's kind of like you're in the middle of a hurricane, rather. Like, the winds mm-hmm. are, are blowing, for those familiar with hurricanes, um, or have experienced them. You know, like, it's just, the, the conditions, this is not Earth. This is definitely... No, this is, I, what's, it's, the, what's the most unlivable planet? Yeah, I was going to say, what's the most... I said unlivable. <laughs> Excuse me. <laughs> um, but th- that is what this this place is, and now they're 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 I guess finding the the source of this distress signal, this this beacon, if you will. That's just a series again, of, of again, digits. Uh, this is something I was really uh, thinking about on my most recent watch uh, viewing of this movie. Uh, not a distress signal, a warning. The, a warning. the, the yeah. signal is saying, "Don't come here." <laughs> well, that that was after they had decoded some of it, right? And it's that when they're already deal. on the planet, and then Ripley, uh, who we'll we'll talk we'll talk uh, a good bit about uh, Sigourney Weaver in a minute, but Ripley says, "Hey, there's something going on here. Maybe we should say something." And uh, Ash is like, uh, "You know, by the time we get over there, they'll have figured it out." So. You know, yeah. let's let's not let's not rush. Um, maybe you know, a one of many horrible mistakes made by the people of this movie. Yeah. Uh, then it, we it get, was, Oh, go ahead. No, it's it's just you also get a, like a little hint of the character dynamics right there, kind of like before. It's not that we didn't get much of the dynamics, but we're 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 given very like little hints about everything during just like these small moments like you know in the beginning when they talk about the shares or they talk like to their their captain and then like mm-hmm. now you have this little discrepancy discrepancy this little kind of tidbit between Ash and, and Ripley um so now you know we're we're laying some of the groundwork um mm-hmm. for for much of the interactions later on but then, I mean going back to this discovery you know now the plot starts to thicken with the findings um <laughs> as, as I'd also like to point out real fast, because uh, I don't think we've really given it much praise. The cast in this movie is incredible. Um, this the this imp- crew... Uh, Honestly, it, the impeccable... Yeah, I, I, we talked about John Hurt a few times, but le- I gotta say, the late and great John Hurt, man, I he will be missed. This Yeah, this movie is chock full of it. John Hurt, amazing. Ian Holm, Mr. Bilbo Baggins himself. Uh, you know, he kills it as Ash. He is very... Uh, very quietly, uh, there, there's something about him that you know you just don't really like, and then you find out later exactly why. Uh, Tom Skerritt as our Captain Dallas, uh, Veronica Cartwright as Lambert, Harry Dean Stanton as Brett, uh, Yafet Kodo as Parker, and of course, Sigourney Weaver, uh, who this was only like her third film, and it was her first major role in a movie. Yeah. Uh, and uh, I think let you know. I think we'll go back to kind of breaking it down bit by bit. But talk about someone who kind of comes out of nowhere in this movie to to blow everyone away. I I mean I would say like, well, this is what her fourth acting role. Uh, I think Fifth? yeah, something if like you, that with TV and stuff. Yeah, let, let me tell you something. My earliest memory of watching Sigourney Weaver on screen may come from the Disney feature holes. <laughs> like, like that I can remember like that. I, it's like that. I mm-hmm. happened upon her in a movie and like, I, I could put face to name and, and everything. So I like these beginnings for her a lot, actually, you know, like this, this is a kick-ass role, you know, and, and really not, to men- not to mention, it's like, I love her getup too. She's got like the converse and then like her, like space jumpsuit. You know, she looks like like this cool engineer, and she's very by the book too. Don't don't get it wrong. Like, she, yeah, we'll 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 get to that in a second because I do want to. Yeah, like, well, let, let's let's get back to it. But I mean, she, what a, a kind of a surprising role and character, and also like a kind of a great start for like, uh, you know, a liftoff or a liftoff point for her career. Yeah, it's it's fantastic. So, um, but yeah, so getting to it, they're on the planet. Uh, they are they encounter 
the ship. And I love the shot of the ship, uh, the alien ship on like a cliff. And the way it's staged and the lighting, it's so ominous. It's so eerie. Yeah. Again, uh, and, and what, I, what's I, I, weird for me is I don't even remember looking at it like thinking like, wait, is that a ship? Is that just like a weird odd land formation? It was, I don't know. For me, I was like, I was always, I questioned what exactly I was looking at. So, and I yeah. watch movies with subtitles. Zach, well, so, <laughs> so here's the thing I wanted to talk. Uh, I made a little note about this. Um, the name of the movie came what well, originally, I think when they were drafting it, it was, they were drafting it under the, the, the name Sp- star beast or something so like it was just a working title okay but they landed on the title of alien uh, and that title came from ronald shusett and shusett he specifically chose that title because it has the double meaning it's the noun of the creature of alien and also the adjective of something being alien something being different and unfamiliar right and, you know, when Foreign, i see you know when you see the ship on there, you know, that is, that is alien. It is just, there's, it's not something we recognize the architecture and the, the, the design of it. It doesn't, it doesn't evoke a ship. So when you see it, you're like, I'm, you know, these people are in a place where they shouldn't be. Yeah. I mean, it also reminds me of like, you know, uh, you remember arrival from yeah Denis Villeneuve, like, you know, you look at some of these like crafts that they had, like all these kind of weird oblong objects and things like that. Like it, it kind of makes you think like they, they all play off of that idea, right? It's not like mm-hmm. in Star Wars where it's like, oh yeah, that clunky metal thing or like Star Trek, you know, all these things that are, are kind of identifiable the, as Yeah, like, they're they're recognizable in the scope of human understanding. Right. So that I think that's just a, a very interesting design choice. Um and like a, a even better play on the on the, the term and the phraseology and, and just the meaning of the word alien. Yeah, um, I, uh, because and, I mean it worked. I didn't know. Look and, at me. And, <laughs> I'm the example. <laughs> Look at you. <laughs> but um, no, I I love it because then we go into the ship and it is some of my favorite stuff in this movie. Uh, when they are exploring it and you get these like the shots of like the the tunnels in the ship and they all have that that Giger like you know aesthetic you know where it's like everything's kind of ribbed and everything's kind of everything looks like it's molded and stuff yeah and i mean not to mention it starts to get like also super i mean you said molded like it gets really organic too yeah everything has a biology uh, to it exactly versus you know like i mean i go into a house on planet earth and you know, and the biology is the people living in it and whatever pets or plants uh, they've, they've put I, in here. I believe, I believe I'll, I'll credit Prometheus where they have the line where it's like, God doesn't build in straight lines. You're, yeah, that's true. I was yeah. Trees are the example of that. Yeah. So, uh, <laughs> well, nice. But, um, <laughs> no, I love that. And then they're, they're exploring it and they come to this thing and, I don't think it's named in the movie and I don't even know if it's named in the script, but uh, it might be named in the script, but it is what for, for decades was referred to as the space jockey. And it's this massive hulking, like skeleton petrified creature in this giant weird, like, chair that has like a long i don't know a cannon or a scope on it yeah and i i you know i was about to ask do they have cameras to take photos of these things but they were actually recording video while they were looking at some of this <laughs> stuff so i now feel like a fool for about that yeah they, they they have like little like uh they had the the the, the most primitive version circuit. of zoom of zoom calls <laughs> right exactly <laughs> but uh yeah i, I love there's so much implication in just that set alone. Yeah. That, and, and, you know, they, they, I like it because a, it foreshadows the chest burster because the thing has, they say like, Oh, it looks like something, you know, tore out of it from the inside. Uh, and it has this, like, you see the face of the creature and it's like face is like frozen in this like scream. Yeah. And it's, it's so, eerie and uh this and everything else that happens on the planet i i 
thought about this. You could not get away with this in today's, uh, you know, in in the movies that come out today. I I can't imagine something like this would fly because we live in a world now of franchises and cinematic universes and planting things in movies just so that way they can come to fruition later. And sometimes it's done well and sometimes it's done poorly. And I have to think that if Alien came out today, the whole space jockey scene would infuriate so many people. Um, because I, I think I think it, people would be like, what the hell was that? There was no explanation. It didn't go anywhere. It didn't, I, it didn't do anything. I, and I, I, I would agree. Yeah. I mean, I would agree to a point, right? Like we've we've discussed the concept before in the show, uh, regarded to as the the, the Abrams mystery box, yeah. right? Where the, it could it could kind of play into one of those, and you know, it, it could be further developed, which it is now in the Alien franchise. Right, um, right. But you know, I realistically, if we took out the Alien movie from 1979 and then we put it in 2020, it would take out a lot of influence and a lot of different things. So who knows? In reality. But I see your point. I, I try to make a, a note or a thought of like what movies may have done this and put it in the future um, or, or put it out there and, and what the response was. But I can't, I honestly can't think of many outside I, of like. I think of like. I, 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 well, I tried to bring up Guardians of the Galaxy, though it has like a comic backing. So that's where you get all the proof of some of the stuff. But when, when they go to nowhere and it's right. like a celestial head or, or I, forget, I don't know if it's celestial. I feel like I, I, I'm forgetting the actual name. It no, I think be. I think it might be a celestial. And but you know what? I'm at. I yeah. Go go ahead. Fin- no, but the, like like you people kind of know where that's coming. Like that's an Easter egg or something. So maybe that doesn't count. No, um, I think I think it's kind of it's it's on the right track. But almost I I would say the only thing with that is that there is a character in that scene to be like, oh, this is what this is, you know. So even if like you go and you go like, what the hell is that? Yeah. You know, the, at least Rocket Raccoon or Groot is there. Probably not Groot, but Rocket Raccoon is there, going like, "Hey, you know, that's a that's a celestial head." For this movie, no one knows what the hell they're looking at, and so like, but I, I will I will give them the credit that they, it's not that they ignore it; they say something about it. They you say know? no, no. I'm not saying they ignore it, but the fact that it doesn't really factor into the movie f- beyond its appearance is such a fascinating thing to me because. Back in 1979, there weren't cinematic universes. There was never the concept of planting something in a movie that would come to fruition uh, in a later movie. The the one I think of that, uh, you know, that I think is done poorly is like in Batman v Superman, where the Flash just shows up in one of Bruce Wayne's dreams. And he's like, yeah. oh, I'm too soon. And then you never find out what it was from. And it not, never went anywhere. And it didn't not yet. to... Oh, because but, the Snyder cut comes out later next right. year. Can't wait. Um <laughs> but it um but it it doesn't contribute to the movie beyond it existing in in the movie. So like I could see like if this movie if Alien came out today and they had the scene of the space jockey, I feel like so many people would be like where was that going? Why was that there? Aside from the fact that it seeds the chest burster. It- it like, would do my favorite thing and let people take their imaginations and create fan theories. Well, that's Yay. well, that's that's what it did for so long. There are yeah. comics that you know. In I think the whole thing about the space jockey and what it is was finally answered in Prometheus and later Alien Covenant right. as to why it looked the way it did, what the chair was, which kind of takes the fun out of everything. But um. Before that, for for decades, there were books, there were comics that explained, you know, what these things were, or at least didn't explain them, but theorized what they were. And there's a whole history that existed before the movies decided to put an answer to that. And I almost prefer when there wasn't an answer because it was really fascinating. But I you're telling me that you don't love Ray Skywalker? No, I fucking hate it. Um, (laughs) uh, we'll get there one day, but um. What was I gonna say? Uh, no, I just I love that scene. I think it is it is this cool thing when they go down, moving on on a little bit when they go down and they find this like bed of uh this nest of eggs, and 
when they're like when John Hurt is shining the light on the eggs and there's like this weird liquid that is like lifting up off the eggs yeah. and stuff. That and that's again, the biology right there that we were talking about. Yeah, you know, like that's an no organic exp- oh. no explanation, but it's it ties into that whole thing that the alienness of it, it the otherness, the uh the blurred lines between recognizable and unrecognizable. Yeah, and plus the, I would say the, I don't know if part of that was animatronic when it kind of opened up and did yeah, that bit. So. That was also, I mean, we've seen animatronic work it, before this movie even, you know, we talked about Star Wars, we talked about, or not necessarily animatronic, but like puppets and, and, and all this stuff, or at least all, you know, all this real, physical, texturized, um, just aspects of filmmaking and, and it, Oh, it really helps you kind of envelop you into the world. Like you said, like have like this, this alien kind of culture to it. And it's also very spooky. Yeah. Um, I just, it's, it's the, yeah, no, it's, it's, there's what else can you say? It's, it's the, they, they, they tapped into a, uh, a intellectual gold mine with this stuff. Yeah. I, I mean, it, it, and then, you know, we kind of, we get our first um, interaction with with our <laughs> with the, the being that so, after Kane kind of happens upon yeah. and just is really interested in into what's happening. So I will say I will say I give movies like Prometheus and uh, Alien Covenant a lot of shit because when there's these spacefaring people and they encounter like either like a little snake creature or these weird mushrooms in uh-huh. space and their first inclination is to lean their face and then be like look at this you know i'm always like what a goddamn fool but <laughs> in this movie he's like look at this alien egg let me put my head near it and but i love it like the 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 mouth of the egg opens up and the insides all nasty and i yeah. think uh the the footage of the of the face hugger leaping out is actually reversed footage uh oh. i'd have to i'd have to check that uh the the facts on that one talk but, about like what a pretty gross incident and it also it kind of ends that's like our first incident of something kind of ending quickly yeah it just right cuts. like like we get that we get that hard cut and then they're they're walking back to the ship um, which, by the way, when they walk back, it doesn't even look like they have Kane with them. I don't know if you saw that. It doesn't look like they're carrying him. It just looks like it's the other two. Um, uh, I'd have to check, but they probably at, hoped you wouldn't notice. Right. And <laughs> so I was like, wait, did they just leave him? Did he die? And I'm like, that's that can't be how this movie goes. Um, and then, you know, we're, we're kind of given, like, what's happening? And then we see this thing around his face in the med bay. Actually, no. Before we even get there, we get the, the interaction uh, between Ripley ah. and, and Ash, or, or or Mother, if you will, the computer system, the um, uh, the twenty the the twenty twenty scene, the, the twenty twenty debacle of uh, they should quarantine. <laughs> They've been infected. Hey, they are carrying something from the outside that may be dangerous to everyone inside, and uh, they use the term quarantine, and they use the term you know uh, disease and spread, and I just. Just this laugh. has been a public service announcement just from the can't fe- help people but laugh. at Scripter Screen. Quarantine matters. Yeah, wear uh, your mask. Stay indoors. <laughs> um. Yeah. So this is is the first kind of interaction. You know, you get a little bit of of Ripley's character coming out, like, or at least where kind of where she is on the uh, on the moral compass, the moral fence. About, well, like about she how says, she feels about the rules uh, and, and I the like, procedures. I like that she's not, she's not some helpless girl. You know, she's like, when Kane and Dallas are gone, I'm in charge. Right. You know, like, I am the next in command. So you, you know, Ash, you better, better not mess around. Yeah. So, I mean, that's, well, I mean, I think, who is it? It's not Dallas that she's talking to. Or she's no, I guess Ash. she, yeah. Um, and then the, she gets like the override that Dallas wants them like on, on board or something. And so they, they now get on the ship and, and we get, uh, you know, our first look at this face hugger, a, a choking out, um, you know, Kane or John yeah. Hurt's character, if you will, which super freaky, uh, as well when they try to pry it off of him and just and get the tightens. whole ass. Yeah. That's like, 
I mean, kind of boa constrictor esque, right? That's you know, pretty like... freaky. And of course, then they try and surgically remove its fingers, and wouldn't you know it, this thing's got acid blood. Right, what she'll breach through the hull, Zach. That's not a good thing, especially not in space. I like how one. I like how that's space accurate in a way, <laughs> right? Like theoretically, but flamethrowers in your, you know, in, in in your halls and everything. That's no one worry about that. No one worry about the pressurization of the I'll ship and the it. oxygen. I'll yeah. forgive it because it's a good movie. <laughs> but um, but I like it, you know, because th- this creature was designed to be. Uh, a movie monster you couldn't just they didn't want it to be a movie monster you could shoot to death right because if it was then w- there's no reason why the why the movie would last as long as it does and there you go it's got acid blood you shoot it you're going to kill yourself uh by being sucked out into the vacuum of space yeah i mean which i mean kind of leads us into a really great ending later on <laughs> well, um yeah, I, I I had a question for you though. Maybe you can uh, help answer this to me because we we get the evolution of the alien kind of f- soon after. Um, we get the infamous scene where now they finally got the thing off of um, John Hurt's face, right? And then they're studying it, and you know John Hurt's at the table, and then wouldn't you know it, this thing just kind of bursts out of him and runs Hello, away. Hello, my baby. Hello, my. <laughs> I wish it was in the same fashion, but. For me, this was weird. Like, um, so I, I'm going to drop the big reveal, Zach. This oh. is my first time watching the <gasps> Alien movie. Dun, dun, dun. Like I said, I, I knew it. I, I mean, at this point, I like knew the movie, but I hadn't watched the movie. So I watched it in, in as, you know, as best as I could with, mm-hmm. you know, all conditions. Instead, it wasn't in a movie theater, but it was in the comfort of my 4K television and, you know, lights off and everything. So I, I right. tried to really zone myself in. Anyways, back to the important stuff. Face hugger, does it like kind of impregnate John yes. Hurt? Okay, yes, that's yes. what happens. So it's basically it 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 drops pop, like it, it poops the egg into his chest. Okay. Or I guess through uh, his mouth then into his yeah. Okay. And then I get, and I get that. It plants that it promptly dies. Right. And then Surprise, a little baby boy is birthed from right. the chest. And then I'm supposed to believe that this little baby boy grows into the xenomorph? Yes. See, Which, when do again, we even get that name, now that I think uh, about it? Xenomorph comes in, I believe, in the second movie, uh, when okay. they're when the marines are kind of breaking down. To me, what ex- I, yeah. I'm a, well, what I always thought was interesting, and listen, this is me thinking about this, trying to put the pieces together. Tell mm-hmm. me where I'm going with this. Okay. This, so the face hugger, I feel like y- by putting this seed into into the human being, it creates this weird genetically infused, like half human, half alien DNA, mm-hmm. and it creates something that walks on two legs and six feet tall. Cool. You know. Is am I am, and is that where this is going? I mean, tell me well, yes. right or wrong. So, so much like you just explained it, uh, and this would not be a concept that is visited until uh, the third Alien film, Alien Three, directed by David Fincher, um, where the alien in that movie uh, comes from a dog and thus walks on four legs. That's and, hilarious. Yeah, it's. You know, it it's uh, the movie. Listen, it's not the worst movie, uh, right. but but David Fincher didn't like it. Um, and uh, yeah, didn't it's, he do Fight Club shortly after? Something like that. But uh, yeah, so the the host informs what the alien uh, will will be, what form it will take. Okay. That's interesting. All right, I just wanted to clarify that I was a little uninitiated. I'm glad that you could help me out figure that. Yeah, thing. no but, problem. But I mean, kind of. I mean, after the whole John Hurt thing, and then we finally get like the hunt. You know, yeah, we, that's we, that's we, like we, when the movie really starts. The categorical shift, if you will, like, and you know, this is probably another strong point of the movie, right? Like, it does what probably most other movies got. You know, I. I I don't know. I mean, the horror genre has kind of been around for a while. This movie being a staple, I would say, where people got a lot of ideas from, or I like it was it was one of the first to do so, rather than like just playing on another trope. But 
uh, it does this thing where after every death or, or just every kind of incident with the alien, it doesn't dwell necessarily on that where the other crew members are like, where's where's Kane or, or where's Parker? You yeah. know, or uh, it, it just kind of like sk- cuts hard cut right after, which is my favorite kind of transition. And they well, talk I about think, like, oh, yeah, we I found f- this person, you know, like. <clears throat> I think what's great about that is because it, it is a more down to earth story like kind of set up no no pun intended is not literally down to earth it is the farthest right. thing from earth but um it's it's very it's treated more realistically the characters are more realistic in their like how they how they behave so to have them like you know having these impassioned and emotional moments uh of their of seeing their comrades die i think would they're, be not little... yeah, they're not teenagers yeah they're not teenagers they're they're adults they're you know yeah. truckers I, I you know they're, they're definitely upset but you know there's no like there's no like tearful goodbyes or anything it's kind of it's it's treated more i want to say mature yeah no i, I would um, agree maturely. with that just because like i i don't know i i just really appreciated that like this was not going to be that kind of movie and i and i think to myself like why didn't other movies follow or filmmakers follow this lead and so, try like where did that trope come from? Why think, did Friday the Thirteenth and and so all these I think, other things? Okay, so like I do think all with that. a lot of I think with a lot of movies they don't have the they don't have the benefit that some of that that Alien kind of has. Where like, Alien it's it's a haunted house movie in space. It is one location. The alien is the only threat mm-hmm. supposedly aboard right. the ship. And so when they die, there's no question of oh where did where did uh, Brett go? Where did Dallas go? It's yeah. like okay, the 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 alien got him. <laughs> like you know, even especially with Dallas, they they actively are watching the the, uh, the sensor. Incident. Yeah, they're watching the sensors kind of show where they are, where he is in relation to the alien, so they know the alien gets him. Um, they even go out at one point and they get one of the bodies and they have like a little funeral, you know, like they, they yeah. put him out the airlock and everything. Yeah, that's for, for Kane. Um, yeah. Well, K- oh, I guess Kane was a little different. Yeah, but but yeah, they, they that's probably as somber as it gets. The I, rest I, are just kind of like, well, damn. They're, they're isn't dead that just too. a funny scene, though? Like, he gets it's, out of the airlock and he just like funny. He spinning. starts tumbling. Yeah, yeah, I'm like, how? <laughs> <laughs> it's just kind of funny. Yeah, uh, if it wasn't for the fact that the scene preceding it is absolutely unnerving the the chest burster scene yeah uh that scene yeah the 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 funeral itself is a little uh unintentionally humorous but um but yeah then you know as the you know more people drop like flies uh we get uh ripley kind of takes center stage as suddenly so like okay Tom scared in this movie I think is a good red herring you think he's gonna be the cap he's the captain he's gonna be the leading man the last man standing mm-hmm. uh one by one he'll watch his crew disappear until it's just him right uh, but no he's like the second or he's a third one to die out of all of them uh and pretty unceremoniously he alien just shows up cut away he's gone um and so at this point, Ripley really comes into it as the main character, uh, the surprise protagonist, and she starts bouncing off the characters. She starts yelling at everyone and taking charge. And uh, you know, this is where Sigourney Weaver really gets to to flex her acting muscles. Yeah, uh, it's, I, it's, I, it's, I, I feel like her kind of taking charge, and then and then we kind of get like these really interesting moments where, where she's her character is also tested by other elements outside of just the, this hulking alien, but like by her own crew members. Yeah. So like Parker and Lambert are definitely, they're a little, uh, they're, they're, they're not willing necessarily to, to hear her out right away because how can Ripley know what to do in this situation? How could anyone know what to do in that situation? Right. Um, but but, uh, but also Ridley has or Ridley uh, Ripley <laughs> ha, has this this desire um, to kind of like 
figure out what, what's really going on. Why can't they? Why can't they like follow protocol? Or why? You know why? Like why can't they like kill this thing? Why do they have to keep it in the ship? Because she gets a lot of uh, you know backlash from from Ash. Yeah, and it's when she goes to to mother, and she learns that it was all kind of ordained by the company and uh and and that the crew is expendable uh in the for the for the sake of bringing this creature back to earth yeah i like and then you i guess you get like this little battle between ash and and ripley oh, as well I, I i love it i love it i know uh i think i think you you weren't entirely thrilled with the with the reveal well um I mean, going into it, at first it just kind of seemed a little... I mean, I get that they had, like, a back and forth and something, but at at one point where you see Ash take Ripley and, like, kind of throw her across the room, I was like, what was that? Like, it's, why it's, is why is he so uncomfortably strong? You know, like... And then, and then you had their little kind of fracas going on, and... Um, he tries to kill her with a porno mag. Right. And and then you, you get his head kind of beaten... You know, a moment later, and, and it reels like, "Oh, he's a goddamn robot." I and, so that's my only that's my only, the only line in the movie I really don't like because I think it's one of those movies where it's like we don't trust the audience to be smart enough to know what's going on. Well, at uh, first when you see like you see like white sweat drops on his forehead, I was like, "Why is this guy like?" He's a sweat in the fettuccine Alfredo. Yeah, I, I was a little confused. <laughs> I mean, no, I'll tell you, what, I was super confused, and then I see his head rip off. I'm like, "Wait, what? Why is he a robot?" <laughs> I, I I thought at first it didn't make sense, and then it kind of dawned on me after. Um, it, uh, this is going to be the next the the second time I reference two thousand one Space Odyssey, but I felt like it, it, there was a kind of a similar relationship right between Hal nine thousand uh, and and Dave, if you will, of of the ship. Um, In that and, and, it's a it's a robot or an artificial intelligence uh, that yeah. you believe is on your side, but ultimately it's also have, working against you and it doesn't and, have your best interests at heart and and it's also like it's under orders from a power bigger than him right because yeah, in the end yep. you find out when when hal's decommissioned you get the video reveal from nasa or the space organization that like there is a true mission that needs to happen yeah uh, you're not just doing whatever you thought you were doing um that that the crew at least still doesn't know about um and so I thought, you know, like, well, I guess we've seen that relationship before, and so this is their way of differentiating about it. And I, and you pointed out to me that, you know, 2001 wasn't the first to have this idea of a, the evil computer or do something as, like, a true mastermind villain. Or, or, or yeah. I guess it's, the company is, like, our, you know, the, the real mastermind, and, and Mother is kind of a conduit, and Ash is also, like... I mean, Ash also kind of lays the groundwork for, for Michael Fassbender's David and Walter, well, and I was, Prometheus well, and, and Covenant. Yeah, I mean, I mean... In Aliens, which I, I'll I'll assume uh, you haven't seen this the sequel, right, right, but uh, but well, in the entire franchise, really, uh, robots or cyborgs or whatever you want to call them, they are a uh, continuing uh, motif in the movies. Yeah, uh, and thank, we thank you this movie Alien for <laughs> establishing that early on. <laughs> and uh, like in Aliens, we get uh, Bishop, who is played by Lance Henriksen. Um, and he is, he's one of the best characters in the sequel. I was going to say, um, is, is he revealed outright to be a, a robot? Is that yes, all the yes, that, that is a, that is a surprise. They really don't try to replicate. Uh, okay. I think they, the, the only other time I think it's a surprise that there's an, a, uh, a robot amongst them is in Alien Resurrection, which is the fourth one. Uh, but at that point the movie stopped being good, so... Okay. Well, I mean, just in in this movie, like in the context of this one by itself, um, it for me it was just weird. I'm like, I, I guess, like I felt like Mother could have even played a bigger role instead of just being a, a regular computer. Like Mother is the equivalent of Siri in the way, yeah, you know, like did. like that's that's how I look at her um, in her relationship to to us now, um, I or will, at least I like will, to the audience. I will say, like, so personally, I don't mind the whole Ash reveal. I I like it. I like his. The way he talks about the alien uh, when they have his head uh, on the table, like, and he's like, like, "Oh, I admire it." Yeah, like he has some good yeah, dialogue and there, and it's it's uh, it's purity or whatever. Um, mm-hmm. I I really like that stuff. There is a, a really great line in the sequel uh, where the android 
um, character of Bishop talks about the particular model that Ash is. Mm -hmm. And uh, again, without, you know, it's, I don't think it's a major spoiler because it's, it's pretty early in the movie. Spoiler for me. It's it's pretty early in the movie and it doesn't okay. really contribute to anything. But I'll, I'll, he talks, I'll let you have it. He just he talks about how that particular model was prone to uh, um, malfunctions and and uh, corruption. So you know it it goes away to explain why Ash suddenly out of nowhere kind of snaps. I mean, did you ever watch 2010, the year they found us? Or read the book, uh, which is the sequel to its. Um, oh, that's the sequel to two thousand one. Yeah, yeah. Uh, they they kind of. T- I I've never seen it or read the Arthur C. Clarke novel. Um, but I've actually I, I I've been thinking about it. But it's I think there's something similar in that one. Um, okay. Well, I mean, you know, I I think it's fine. I think again, I like this idea that you know when you think of a, a robot, you think of like metal and uh oil and stuff yeah, like you, that you don't like think Terminator. of an android really you don't think of like this like weird like spaghetti innards and like white you know fluid for blood again yeah kinda tapping into that whole alien as an adjective thing yeah you know you definitely think... threw me off yeah um i do think it's spaghetti though that that he is filled with at least for the sake of the production oh god well, I mean, listen. I've worked with some really great props and, and art department people that that would use anything. I had a guy make cigar out of a uh, cardboard, which was it looked super good, actually. Hey, hey you know what? Uh, the blood in Night of, uh, Night of the Living Dead is chocolate syrup. So. Oh, a lot of people do that, actually. Yeah. So. Um, yeah. Yeah. It, 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 it holds it better. Yeah. And when it, and wouldn't you know it, Ripley. Uh, turns around and uh, Lambert and Parker get taken out in the same scene. Yeah, that's true. And, uh, and, and we're kind of left with just just Ripley and Jonesy. Yeah, and then luckily for her, she's quite the 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 PETA enthusiast because she's not going to leave Jonesy. By... Let me tell you something about this cat. I love this cat. That cat you're, does you're not a, give. You're that a cat, cat guy. <laughs> I like cats. Yeah, but. Uh, that cat does not give a shit about this alien, even no. when it is right up in its face. No, I, even that, as the cat is watching Brett be like, have his skull caved in. Listen, the there's a part just, of the cat that's a little afraid. The cat kind of backs up a little bit when out of like right, the right. But, it's like, ooh, I gotta get out of here. I got the, eight more <laughs> lives. I need to live. There's that great moment of like, I mean, great moment. There's a moment where Brett dies, and they just show the cat's face, and the cat's just kind of like. Yep, I would do it too if I was big enough. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, but yeah. So then, yeah, it gets down to Ripley. Ripley start. You know, she's like, I. You know what? This is a lost cause. Starts initiating the self destruct sequence uh, for the Nostromo. I love the self destruct sequence. I love how how industrial it feels. I love how complicated it is. Uh, I I feel like there's you know a lot of times like the self destruct sequence. It's like a a big red button under a glass panel and uh, just be careful not to touch it. But like this, it's like you got to do this and you got to do that and you got to hit these buttons and it opens up this panel on the floor and then you have to take these keys and activate this thing and press more buttons and raise up these, these things. And then you it, it has like this whole sequence, if you will, of just kind of not, I don't want to say like just, arbitrary or random things but it's it's a lot more in depth than just like open the conduit and hit the self-destruct button in t-minus right. 10 <laughs> you know it, it's it's not a dr evil type sequence i um, i love it. it it feels it feels like i said industrial it feels like it would totally make sense for this type of vessel yeah um i like that it's like you got 10 minutes but you have five minutes to turn it off so yeah. d- in the event that someone accidentally did trip it or tripped it it, it uh, kind of reminds me of, of like a nuclear launch sequence where it's like you need to turn keys on like this end and you need to go to the other ship and do it as well. And it just yeah. it requires a bunch of clearances and like, yeah, I, I would agree it this. So you mentioned to me, uh, uh, you know, in our notes that you felt th- that something like this isn't um, it's just it, it's a lot more exaggerated and, and like to the point in other things where it just it's kind of god awful versus this is could be a little more realistic in, in a way which I agree and I feel like in my experience in movies I don't know if I've seen it 
uh, in other, like in short forms or like outside of Austin Powers and the destruction of, of evil bases or like in James Bond, I guess the, the, the latter before them. Um, you know, it's, it's always been kind of like turnkey styles and also like do this little puzzle or, I mean, not puzzles, but you, <laughs> yeah, you, you get what I'm it. saying. And I feel like that's probably uh, the norm. And, and maybe even like this movie helped establish something like this for movies to come later, like after it. And, and, and it's just, again, like this, this movie helped lay the groundwork um, for, for, for little things, you know, things like that. Um, and versus like, it doesn't play on tropes. Like this, this movie started the trope, you know, yeah, uh, I, as I, another way of putting, putting it. I, I just, I, it was, it was one of those details where I was just like, I like that in, in, they, they went through the trouble of designing this and designing a system about it that like, you know, if I was there, if I'm, if I was there in the ship, I feel like, uh, of course, like it wouldn't ever be you know, it would never be a question that that was real, mm-hmm. and that was that 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 it may that it didn't make sense for the universe. It makes so much sense. It is a a very clunky system, but it's it's like that, so you wouldn't accidentally blow up your own ship. Yeah, uh, and I, I think it's great. I, I'll tell you what I do have a problem with, and it's not the sequence, but it's it's what happens post sequence, and uh, maybe. This is a, a a bigger nitpick than the thing I had mentioned, uh, or the two things I'd mentioned earlier, uh, which is post uh, ejection into the, the the smaller vessel, the escape pod vessel, if you will. Mm-hmm. Um, you get like this spectacular light show of uh, the the N- Nostroso. What I, Nostromo. <laughs> Nostromo. Excuse me. I I dyslexia. Um, That's okay. The, the Nostromo blowing up, but you have these like three different phases of of fireworks, like light show, and I'm like, this is just the self destruction of a ship. You know, the Death Star only blew up in one blow. Like this thing's like supernova going like crazy. Hey man, you gotta you gotta you gotta make sure you gotta make sure whatever's on it is yeah, is yeah, gone I, for good. I, I'll give it the the images that they showed of the Nostromo. The, this ship one looked massive. Number yeah. one, like ginormous, which is kind of weird because we only saw certain parts of the inside. But I mean, you know, they're not going to go to every part of the ship. But then again, how did the alien find all the people if the ship's so big? Regardless, that's with a, its a sense a, of smell. With yeah, that's the, against the point. Um, but yeah, this show, the show, um, this this movie just kind of like uh, it, it put on this kind of spectacular event in the end. Also, like it really an interesting way to like kind of end the movie, but also not end the movie. I think well, that's what I was about to say. I think it's it is a a red herring of like you get this spectacular light show and you're like, yeah, we went out on a bang, but then just as Ripley, you know, undresses and gets comfortable for her long sleep, yeah, uh, a, a hand pops out of the wall and you go, oh shit, it's not over yet. Yeah, I love this part though because then she goes and hides in the like the spacesuit closet, and like she gets herself ready. and And I don't know if you've ever played Alien Isolation. This is probably uh, the... no, I was too afraid. So I played Alien Isolation at le- for actually even for a holiday event back when I used to play video games on YouTube. Um, it was, and this is something that they implemented into the game so well. But in the end, she kind of gets in this suit. And she decides like I'm gonna open the airlock. I'm gonna like get this guy out like that talk about clever you know we uh, we talked about this two other times one uh this is jaws in space i go back and i think mm-hmm. about how jaws was handled he blew up in this spectacular fashion and you know it's like oh you know that was great but then in duel there was kind of this slow death this one kind of puts the two together in a way it's like you get a that spectacular yeah. yeah you get that spectacular fashion of like blowing up but it, in the end it didn't really matter because the alien, what a great reveal, right? You said it was this red herring, like the you know the xenomorph is in the cockpit of your ship. It's it's still about to get you. You have to find something else to do, and you got to do it fast. And she does, and and, and yeah, thing- I mean, I think you know it's a great moment where she, you know, up until this movie, you know, at first they, at first they're like, okay, we're gonna try and capture it. We're gonna try and secure it in in the air ducts, and and then. From there, we can shoot out into space. That didn't work. Started killing everyone off. So they said, okay, we're just going to abandon ship. We're just going to run away from it. Yeah. And 
and they run away from it, and that doesn't work. And so now it's like, okay, you can back, only do one thing. The, back to only, plan A again. There's only two options now. You can either die, or you can get creative with a harpoon gun. Yeah. And, and I gotta say, you know, like, thank God she got Jonesy in hypersleep, you know, <laughs> like, before all this, because that would have been another mess. Um, also, the harpoon gun thing, too, when you, you just bring that back up, but, like, because he almost got stuck on there, and then she, like, blasted him with the engine. Yeah. Um, or it, or whatever. It's just, oh, man. Yeah, that, it's, it's... This movie ended in, in a spectacular fashion, I feel and, like. I, and I really... Let's, let's talk about that ending, because... Uh... In 1979, having a, you know, sci-fi blockbuster type movie end with a female hero as the last man standing, that, you know, not to say there weren't female-led movies before. No, but, but, what, but women, I mean, like... This was not something you would see at the time. It was It was pretty unprecedented that a a woman would be the last man standing and would be the hero of everything. I agree. I feel like... And, I mean, you know, you can look at things like today, uh, the the video game, the Metroid series, how you have Samus, who at the end of the first game is revealed to be a woman, and it's like, you know, of course, that game series draws heavily from the alien series uh it's inspired by a lot even her samus's main and uh enemy antagonist whatever is named ridley um no but but you have like like leia in star wars right that happened like two years before and mm -hmm. and you know she was still this strong independent character yeah uh and like had some great moments and then would later have even like even greater moments um you know right but I would and almost it, say, like, Princess so, Leia, as, as awesome as she is, she's a very reactive character in that, you know, she kind of goes with the flow of the movie. And you get to a certain point in Alien where Ripley, she takes charge and she's the one who's kind of making the calls and saying, this is what we're going to do. We're going to, you know, uh, she she's the one who decides to abandon the ship. She's the one who opposes Ash. She's the one her, who ultimately... Listen, I know this came after, but Leia did slay Jabba the Hutt. Well, yes, so. I know, I know. We're talking, I mean, that's after the fact. Right, but, but, but it's I, all but, within the same time frame. But you have to also, I mean, I, I think you have to consider that the impact of of Sigourney Weaver... I, I think her and, character and her definitely... role... I think as as a woman in, in film she definitely helped pave the way for a lot of like future i think it told a lot of people hey roles. this is something that not only can happen but is really awesome that's i agree cuz cuz now ripley was ri originally written as a man in the script and it wasn't until afterward that they decided to turn ripley into a woman and I, I believe Sigourney Weaver has gone on record saying that she believes they did this for the shock factor of mm -hmm. her being the last one standing, um, as opposed to one of the, the her her male co stars. Mm -hmm. Um and whether or not that was the reason or not, I think, you know, it's a stroke of genius because un she was a relatively unknown actress at the time and up until Dallas dies you really she's she's just kind of a side character yeah i uh, i mean i i feel like she really kind of comes into her own because now she she owns the franchise dude well yeah so she so has, she she is she remains uh you know the the face of the franchise for a very long time it's gotten to the point that you know the the franchise has moved on without Ripley, but um, m mostly in prequels, I should say. Yeah. But uh, but you know her her state her uh her footprint on like the sci-fi uh genre is is there. I mean, she's I have to think you know she she worked with James Cameron uh, on Aliens, and then would later work with him again on uh Avatar, Avatar. the yeah. Blue People Avatar. Not the, the airbenders. The, yeah, exactly. And um, 
how she was, you know, in, in Avatar, she is a, uh, a scientist, but her character is very similar to Ripley and kind of the, she doesn't take shit from anyone. She's very, uh, she's tough as nails and stuff. Um, but, but at, at her core is still a deeply caring person, which we see a lot more in the sequel with Ripley where, uh, I think her character is expanded on in such an, uh, a brilliant way uh, in the next movie. But even in just Alien Alone, it's it's so great. She goes from, you know, someone who <laughs> quite literally, physically in some scenes, struggles to uh, to maintain her her uh, her dominance uh, to dominating this creature that is supposed to be the perfect life form. You know, I I do want to say, kind of going outside of the franchise and Sigourney Weaver's career, she was nominated for Best Actress for her role in Aliens, the sequel of this. Uh, um, okay, yeah, I, I want to say Academy, maybe I knew that, but I forgot. Academy Awards. So, I mean, like, listen, I think uh, it just kind of goes to show that she, you know, uh, a treasure. Amongst... Yeah, she's, she's awesome. Uh, if we ever get get the chance I say if when we get the chance to cover aliens that's going to be a really fun one because uh that definitely they took a step back they said let's not do horror let's do action and aliens is just a really kick-ass movie um and a really interesting way to follow up something like uh like alien yeah for sure but um I don't know I think that I think that kind of covers it as far as uh this particular movie is concerned well Hey, Zach, I just want to say thank you for joining me in this lovely conversation of Alien. Um, and uh, thank you for listening to our audience. This has yes. been our uh, October Halloween special. Our though, spooky spook cast. Though this is not on delivered on Halloween, please enjoy it a little early. And um, please be safe. Please remember, as the movie told you, quarantine if need be. Uh, or else you risk uh, infection, disease, and, and uh, killing aliens. killing everyone you know. Yeah, and aliens. Let that be a lesson. Uh, you do you want people. to plug any social media? I actually, anything? you know, we didn't do this in the beginning. and We, we totally to said do... we were going to do it in the beginning and then immediately forgot. We got too into some really good conversation, though. So I will say this. <laughs> Guys, um, we, we want to appreciate everything the, the, the audience, the listeners, you specifically you have done for our show. Uh, and I want to introduce uh, a little piece of information that I don't know if we've mentioned before, but on our website, www.scripterscreen.com or anchor.fm slash screen, we have a feature. It is called the message feature. It what's allows... That? What's, 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 the, what's the messenger messaging Okay, okay guy, let, me, let me slow your roll and I'll tell you what it is. Tell guy. me. All right, so what it is, you download the app or on your computer, you hit the message button on the screen, and it allows you to record a voice message and ask us anything you want. Maybe suggest a show. Uh, do you have comments about a past show? And we can implement that message into our next episode of Script or Screen. Um, and outside of that, leave us a comment on all your favorite services. Leave us a review. Do you like us? Do you like us even more than the last guy liked us? Do you not like us? I don't want to hear that, but you know. <laughs> what um, social medias can they find us on? You can find us everywhere at Scripter Screen. I'm talking Facebook. I'm talking Twitter. I'm talking Instagram. I'm talking YouTube. Uh, subscribe, like, follow, uh, visit us. My name is uh, Chris Kitchen. I'm Zach Strackman. Thank you for listening uh, and have a wonderful week. Bye.